Tonight's summer scorcher, the heat wave hitting parts of Canada and new predictions of an overheating planet. It's the Triple H's, the heat, the haze and the humidity. The battle against blistering temperatures. It's important to stay hydrated. And the weather pattern causing concern worldwide. We are likely to have one of the warmest year on record. Killing infections with viruses. It's such a relief. It's been really hard. An experimental treatment to take out a dangerous superbug. Plus, targeting Twitter. Strategically, intentionally, unashamedly similar. The rollout of Mark Zuckerberg's new app to rival Elon Musk's online platform. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. The first full week of July is starting with a jolt of summer for millions in central Canada. Tonight, most of Ontario and parts of Quebec are under heat warnings. The sizzling temperatures coming as the UN Weather Agency is issuing a dire warning, predicting a spike in global temperatures and extreme weather because of El Nino. This is a result of a rapid and um, substantive change, both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. In fact, yesterday was the hottest day ever recorded on the planet. CTV's Heather Butts on the extreme heat in Canada and how long it's expected to last. The sweltering heat and humidity smothering Ontario and parts of Quebec with warnings from Environment Canada over grueling conditions. Summer's great, but the heat's a little too much. Roughly half a million Torontonians are living in apartments without air conditioning. That city is now extending some outdoor pool hours, with many municipalities also opening cooling centres. We've got a little umbrella and we'll hit the water later on, go for a swim. Environment Canada is forecasting maximum temperatures of 33 degrees in some areas, with a humidex in the high 30s to low 40s, with little relief overnight. The nights are going to be warm, up 20, 22 degrees. Boy, a lot of tossing and turning when you get when you get those that kind of condition. Experts are telling people to be aware of heat-related illness, like swelling, rash, cramps, fainting, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and the worsening of some conditions. The most effective way of controlling your body temperature is by sweating. And when the humidity goes up, you don't sweat. The water just sits on your skin. It doesn't evaporate. Those who do work outside taking extra precautions. We stop uh, whenever we feel thirsty or tired. We're allowed to go into the truck and in AC. Very well organized when it comes to the heat. In the U.S., an unrelenting heat wave continues to scorch some states where conditions have been deadly. The kind of extreme heat events climate scientists say will be more common. The temperature will be high and humidity as well will be high for a couple of days, I would say until at least Thursday. Climatologists expect a warmer than normal month of July and say we'll be talking a lot about the heat, haze and humidity this summer. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. The twister that tore through Alberta this weekend has now been classified as one of the most ferocious in Canada's history. It was rated as an EF4 on the enhanced Fujita scale, which goes from 0 to 5. Top wind speeds reached 275 kilometers per hour. The last uh, F4 tornado that was seen in Alberta was the Edmonton tornado from 1987. So that speaks to how rare a tornado of this rating is. The wind's vicious enough to toss this combine, weighing nearly 10,000 kilograms. Environment Canada says the funnel cloud was formed by a supercell thunderstorm that lasted 30 minutes. The scar left on the farmland was noticeable enough to see via satellite. Police in Quebec have confirmed they have found two bodies they believe were swept away by a devastating landslide on Canada Day. Police are waiting to confirm their identities. One of the two people missing was identified as Pascal Racine. No details about the missing man. There are growing concerns tonight about the impact of British Columbia's port strike on small businesses and consumers. More than 7,000 workers who load and unload cargo have been on strike since Saturday. The Port of Vancouver and Port of Prince Rupert are the busiest and third busiest in the country. An estimated $800 million worth of goods pass through BC's ports each day. 
And tonight, both sides are showing no real signs of a breakthrough. Here's CTV's BC Bureau Chief Melanie Nagy. At a quiet port of Vancouver, piles of cargo containers sit unloaded. And as they go unmoved due to a crippling strike now in its fourth day, Ed Habley anxiously analyzes his inventory. The furniture store owner's much needed shipment is stuck at the port. So there'll be delays and that will affect the orders for the customers. Habley's independent business is just one of hundreds impacted by a labor dispute between more than 7,000 unionized waterfront workers and the Maritime Employers Association. So as soon as a strike is launched, uh, businesses can feel the impact. The strike, which began Saturday, has hit 35 terminals across B.C., all of which collectively move an estimated 25 percent of Canada's imports and exports. This is critical. It hits every part of our economy in Canada. It sounds like the parties just aren't reaching a deal right now. Better pay, port automation and contracting out are the main issues at the bargaining table. However, talks are said to be stalled with both sides accusing the other of being unreasonable. Well, yeah, it's, it's frustrating. Dealership owner Brandon Knott is discouraged by the labor dispute. All of our vehicles are supposed to be getting going through the port in Vancouver to, to land, so those are all getting pushed back now. Existing supply chain issues have left many of Knott's customers waiting for months. He fears they'll now wait even longer. You have customers who have waited a year to get their car, and now it's like it could be another 30 days to six months. With so much at stake and the two sides reportedly so far apart, many business owners and associations are calling on the federal government to implement back-to-work legislation, something Ottawa has yet to publicly support. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. There is another layer tonight on the confusion inside the public safety minister's office about the prison transfer of serial killer Paul Bernardo. Newly released emails obtained by media, including CTV News, revealed the Commissioner of Correctional Services was among those who couldn't figure out why Marco Mendicino was left in the dark. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver has the story. In the days after Paul Bernardo was moved to a medium security prison, the Corrections Commissioner expressed her confusion about how the transfer took the Public Safety Minister by surprise. I understand from my staff that someone at the Public Safety Department said the Minister had not been notified. Commissioner Ann Kelly wrote to the Deputy and Assistant Deputy Minister of Public Safety on June 6th. We have a notification process in place, as you know, and we certainly followed it. The Corrections Department started that notification process in March with an email in late May informing the Public Safety Minister's office Bernardo's transfer was imminent. It will occur next week, Kelly wrote in an email titled High Profile Offender. The Prime Minister and Public Safety Minister's offices have been advised. We have media lines ready. The Deputy Minister replied minutes later thanking the Commissioner for the confirmation. It is uh, very clear that I should have been briefed at the time um, and that is something that I made abundantly clear uh, to my staff. But he wasn't. Marco Mendicino says he only found out after Bernardo was moved. Paul Bernardo? That is a bolt of lightning. A former senior Liberal staffer, Scott Reed, says there's no excuse for the communications failure. It's a head shake. It's mind-boggling. This will now forever be destined to be the absolute textbook example of how senior staff should not do their job. The families of Bernardo's victims, Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey, want Bernardo back in maximum security and want more transparency around the decision. CSC says that they're following the law, but they refuse to tell us what criteria they're using. Though controversial, this criminologist says the move to medium security appears to follow the law. What happens in the institution is that there's a little bit more movement. There are more opportunities for him to do different kinds of things. Uh, but, but the surprising thing is that he was in maximum security as long as he was. The federal prison service is currently looking into Bernardo's transfer. But when that review will be complete, Omar, is unclear. All right, Annie, thank you. There were mass shootings at multiple locations in the United States over the holiday weekend. The deadliest incident occurred in Philadelphia. That's where a person wearing body armor opened fire in a neighborhood, killing five people and injuring four others. A 40-year-old suspect is under arrest, and police are looking at this surveillance video as part of their investigation. With the evidence that we do have available to us, that these acts were done knowingly and intentionally. 
No arrests have been made in Fort Worth, Texas, where police say three people were killed and eight injured in a shooting during a 4th of July celebration. Israeli forces started leaving the city of Jenin after carrying out one of their biggest military operations in the West Bank in years. There are a few signs tonight of the violence that drove thousands from their homes and left 13 Palestinians dead, along with one Israeli soldier. What happens next is unclear, especially after what was described as a revenge attack in Tel Aviv. CTV's Judy Trin reports. More than 1,000 Israeli troops have begun pulling out of the occupied West Bank city of Jenin. For two days, drones dropped missiles on a Palestinian refugee camp. <laughs> Among the dead, three children. We are alarmed at the scale of air and ground operations that are taking place in Jenin uh, and continuing uh, today in the West Bank, and especially on airstrikes hitting a densely populated refugee camp. More than 100 people have been injured. The Palestinian health minister accused Israel of attacking hospitals and medical personnel. But Israeli officials say the strikes were targeted, aimed at militants, some who were among the casualties. The source of that terrorism has become more and more recently. Um, their bases have, have been built up in Jenin. After the raids, Israeli forces discovered a tunnel dug under a mosque, along with a cache of hidden explosives. Unable to match the might of the Israeli army, cruder methods are used to retaliate. In Tel Aviv, a Palestinian man drove his truck into a crowded bus stop. The driver got out and began stabbing people until he was shot by a bystander. Luckily, there was an individual, a civilian who was armed, and he managed to neutralize this terrorist. Militant group Hamas claimed responsibility for the attack. Analysts say the violence will be repeated as long as Israel focuses on expanding Jewish settlements into the Palestinian territories. It's impossible to think that you're going to continue to expand your settlements, put in more settlers uh, into that area, continually expand and, and take the land of another people and not expect some kind of reaction or resistance. As the operation in Jenin comes to a close, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will continue targeting terrorists. Meanwhile, scores of Palestinians are losing hope in a political solution. Omar. All right, Judy, thank you. Ukrainian officials say a Russian missile strike injured more than 40 people, including a three-month-old baby in the Kharkiv region. Around 100 people were attending a funeral for a fallen soldier at the time. The strike came after an alleged Ukrainian drone attack in Russia. The Kremlin claims Ukraine launched five drones on Moscow, forcing the brief shutdown of a local airport. A Canadian first in the fight against the growing threat of superbugs. Researchers are using viruses that act like smart bombs to treat dangerous infections. CTV's medical correspondent Avis Favaro has the exclusive details. This odd-looking virus called a phage is what helped stop an untreatable urinary tract infection that left Victoria Marshall in pain for seven long years. It's such a relief. It's been really hard. One in four women around the world suffer UTIs, but some of the infections can't be killed with antibiotics. In Victoria's case, her superbug destroyed one kidney and she feared it would take the other. My quality of life and my prospects were diminishing by the year. So she became the first Canadian in a study of a new approach, using phages to target the bacteria and hijack them to produce more phages, keeping infections in check. Some were infused into her bladder, others she drank or applied to her skin. I started to feel better within about 48 hours. We're really excited about the progress so far, and we're looking to see how this data comes together and we get information from our collaborators to show that the infection is uh, truly gone. Phages are found throughout nature and were first discovered by a Canadian scientist over a century ago. This is a really important first step for Canada to go on the record and, you know, plant the flag in the ground for Phage Canada. But the treatment remains experimental, although countries around the world are starting pilot programs. Everything we have seen in our global experience with, with phage therapy um, is vindicated that it, it's safe and, and it's ready to move forward. The study will now test these phages on some 200 other women with superbug infections over the next two years. 
Meanwhile, Victoria is reveling in the good news in this text from her doctor. Happy to report your last urine showed no significant growth and you are considered clinically and microbiologically cured. Offering hope to millions of desperate patients around the world. Avis Favreau, CTV News, Toronto. Time for a break, but when we come back, a new face at the helm of Hockey Canada, plus roller coaster rescue, a frightening mishap at the fair. The degenerative brain disease CTE is commonly found in male athletes. Tonight, we're learning of the first diagnosis in a professional female athlete. The finding made on the brain of former Australian rules footballer Heather Anderson. The 28-year-old died by suicide last year. CTE is associated with repeated traumatic brain injuries and can only be diagnosed after death. Hockey Canada has hired a new leader in an ongoing transformation after a series of scandals. Catherine Henderson takes over as president and CEO after seven years as the head of Curling Canada. She replaces Scott Smith, who resigned along with the entire board of directors last fall. The leadership change was enough to convince one of its biggest corporate sponsors, Bauer, to jump back on board. Former National Chief Roseanne Archibald is speaking out for the first time since she was removed by the Assembly of First Nations part of a public push to try to get her job back days ahead of the AFN's next meeting in Halifax. CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Creason Ajkate reports. Former Assembly of First Nations National Chief Roseanne Archibald isn't going down without a fight. I don't want to be reinstated because of my ego. I want to be reinstated because I have a sacred responsibility that I have to fulfill. She asked her supporters to go to their chief and councils and call for her to be reinstalled so she can continue to push for a forensic audit within the AFN. I know that this pushback I'm getting is because I have been fighting corruption at the AFN since October of 2020. That's when I first heard about financial improprieties. Last week, Archibald was ousted in a closed virtual assembly attended by 231 delegates. 71% voted to adopt a non-confidence motion against Archibald. The AFN would not comment today, but said last week her removal is due to a human resources investigation into complaints against the national chief, including harassment and retaliation against staff. Discipline is necessary. I think the National Chief should be held responsible for in, any inappropriate actions with staff members. But the bottom line is, do you remove her for that? This lawyer says the fight for transparency within the AFN has been ongoing for more than a decade. We still want the forensic audit and that we want to do this in a healing way, in accordance with our own traditions, not the toxic corporate conflict. The top job will remain vacant until an interim National Chief is selected. But for now, those chiefs who ousted Archibald will have to answer to the more than 600 chiefs in their assembly here in Halifax next week. Omar. All right, Creason, thank you. Still ahead, a massive firefight. When I smelled that, I just turned around and, and got out of there. That's nothing somebody should be breathing. The impact of an industrial inferno in Winnipeg. A massive industrial fire is still burning in Winnipeg tonight, prompting the evacuation of nearby homes over air quality concerns. It smelled like burning rubber, burning electrical equipment. Like, it was just bad. Flames broke out early this morning at a former metal manufacturing plant used to store chemicals and tires. No injuries were reported. The cause of the fire is under investigation. And an investigation has started after terrifying moments for thrill seekers at a festival in Wisconsin. A lot of people were just trying to figure out, uh, just like just like the amusement crew, trying to figure out what's going on, what's what's happening. All of a sudden, uh, the ambulances are showing up, the fire department's showing up, the uh, everybody just coming out of the woodwork. Some were hanging upside down for at least three hours when the fireball ride stopped because of a mechanical failure. 
Crews had to use special equipment to bring riders down to safety in harnesses. Fortunately, no injuries. Just frightening. Well, this next story is sure to turn anyone's stomach upside down. Chestnut, 61 is going to be there. For the 16th time, American Joey Chestnut gobbled his way to the top of the 4th of July hot dog eating contest. 62 francs in 10 minutes. And in case you're wondering, with the buns, that's more than 18,000 calories. Six times what's recommended for men his age and size. On the women's side, Mickey Sudo downed 39 and a half hot dogs to take home the crown. And that is why they're both being called champions. After the break. Essentially, if you're going to design a Twitter clone, this is exactly what it would look like. Meta unveils its new app in its bid to take on Twitter. There's an escalating fight between two tech titans to tell you about tonight. Mark Zuckerberg and his company Meta are unveiling a new app set to launch Thursday, aimed at taking down Elon Musk's Twitter. CTV's John Venavelli Rao on the battle of the billionaires. Sure, Elon Musk has projected plenty of confidence in Twitter, but likely he's not at all amused by what's about to pop up on phones later this week, an app some are calling a potential Twitter killer. I think Threads is going to pose a huge threat to Twitter uh, because it's coming from the Meta and Instagram family of apps. Musk's rival, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, allowing users to pre-order his company's Threads app, which will be linked to Instagram, and in preview shots, it looks an awful lot like Twitter, Meta calling it Instagram's text-based conversation app. Essentially, if you're going to design a Twitter clone, this is exactly what it would look like. The unveil is a direct challenge to Musk and Twitter, which has faced plenty of controversies since he bought it last year for 44 billion U.S. Just this past weekend, users complained after temporary restrictions were imposed on how many tweets they could see. User frustration is not a key to success in customer experience. Meta clearly thinks there's an appetite for a Twitter-like platform minus Musk. Others have tried, but with more than 2 billion people using Instagram monthly, some think an app linked to it could be popular. I feel like at the end, with the way Twitter is going, I feel like Instagram will have the advantage at the end. Though some Twitter users aren't so sure. I would just keep Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We I have just... enough apps. <laughs> at Meta, we're focused on... The launch of the new app will no doubt intensify the rivalry between Zuckerberg and Musk, who recently challenged the Facebook founder to a cage fight. And Musk has boasted in such a battle, his size might be an advantage. I'm going to use a a move called the walrus, where I just lie on you <laughs> and you can't get away. <laughs> but for now, all eyes will be on the battle online between their heavyweight companies starting Thursday. John Venavalli Rao, CTV News, Toronto. And that's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.